Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today is with great pleasure that my guest is Dr. Sarah Irving. Sarah is at the currently 11 Hulma uh, Early Career Research Fellow, and she's working on the history of the 1927 earthquake that uh, uh, hit Palestine, and obviously we're going to talk about it in general and perhaps focusing a little bit on the regions of Jerusalem. And she's also a lecturer at Staffordshire University, which is based on Stockholm Trent, uh, obviously in the UK. And she is the editor in chief of Contemporary Levant. Contemporary Levant is a relatively new journal, which is published by the Council for British Research in the Levant. Uh, and hopefully soon we will have uh, uh, the director of the Kenyan Institute, which is uh, again a spin off of the uh, CBRL uh, in uh, East Jerusalem. Now, uh, I must disclose. You know, there's a disclaimer here. Sarah was awarded her PhD from the University of uh, Edinburgh in 2018, which I had the uh, privilege of examining. And uh, then she's taught in different uh, places, particularly King's College in London and uh, Leiden, a uh, great place. And from Leiden, we will have a guest in the coming weeks, Karen Sanchez, and then again in Edge Hill and Linus Universities. Now, she has an extensive list of publications. I'm not going to mention uh, many of them, but one, because it's uh, in press and it will be available uh, as open access later on, which is The House of a Priest, which is uh, an edited work by Sarah uh, Sharben Nassif and Karen Sanchez that I said we will interview uh, shortly. But before we get into the conversation, Sarah, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be invited to be on your podcast. Thank you, Sarah. And you have an extensive list of publications, very diverse from each other. You've been uh, uh, a scholar for quite some time, and certainly you've been involved in the history of Palestine for a long time, if I may. So I was wondering, how did you get to work on Palestine and what triggered your interest in this region? It's it's kind of a long story, and I'm going to try to keep it as short as possible. Um, so it very much came not through a sort of general interest, particularly in the Middle East, but more through the fact that um, in my late teens and 20s and into my 30s, I was very involved in lots of um, political activism. Um, and I didn't get involved in Palestine stuff um, sort of early on in that particularly for two reasons, partly because it was the mid 1990s when I was at university and I first got involved particularly in direct action politics. Um, and so from the perspective of a sort of 19 year old English girl, um, you know, we knew that the Oslo peace process was happening, things were supposed to be getting fixed. Um, so although I was involved in quite a lot of international um, activism, it was mainly actually um, uh, involving uh, Central America and particularly Nicaragua. Um, uh, the second reason for, that I didn't really get very involved was because a lot of my friends at university um, were from the British Jewish community. They, although a lot of them had um, on their years out in Israel before they went to university, been very sort of critical of, of aspects of Israeli policy, um, they were also quite suspicious of the Palestine solidarity movement in Britain, which I can to some extent understand. So I kind of stayed away from it for a while. And then a few years later, it's 2002, it's Bonfire Night 2002. So Bonfire Night, um, the night in Britain, the 5th of November, when we um, celebrate burning Catholics, basically. Um, <laughs> So, so, so Guy Fawkes Night, um, this, this historical commemoration. Um, and a few of my friends were sitting around a bonfire 
on the uh, council estate, the public housing estate that we used to live on. Um, and they said, uh, and two of them said, oh, guess what we're doing at Christmas? We're going to Palestine. Um, and so, as I said, this was sort of late 2002, the year into the Second Intifada, and this new organization called the International Solidarity Movement had put out a call for internationals with experience of direct action to come to the West Bank. And I thought that I would be going for a couple of weeks. Um, they had a very organized two weeks sort of planned around Christmas that was supposed to be partly meeting various sort of Palestinian politicians and local community activists and various figures and um, supporting Palestinians who wanted to take nonviolent direct action. So to do things like march with them so that they were less likely to be um, attacked by Israeli soldiers and things like this. Um, and I thought that I would do that the way that I had sort of done um, other forms of international activism and that I would come back to Britain and it would become part of my general activism. Only I went. Um, I think it's not uncommon for people who go to Palestine to find themselves hooked in some way, even if they never expected it. Uh, I was actually quite badly injured, uh, which I think kind of intensified the extent to which it was a very sort of emotional experience for me. I got quite badly beaten up by a border guard at Erez border crossing because we were supposed to be going to Gaza, although we didn't. Um, so I'd ended up in Palestinian hospital and sort of seen kind of what that experience looks like and, and all of that sort of thing. So from that, I kind of ended up instead being very, very involved for quite some time. I went back a few months. No, so I said 2002, I meant 2001, Christmas 2001, I was there. I then went back on Easter 2002, which was uh, when Operation Defensive Shield happened. So I was there again. And um, the, the, the sort of activism then in, turned um, more into being involved very much with some of the early stages of um, the growth of Palestinian fair trade produce being involved in the UK. So I did quite a lot of work around that kind of thing. And I had also already had some experience as a journalist. So the journalism side also expanded. Um, and via a somewhat um, bumpy and unplanned route that then led me in 2010 or early 2011, to apply for a PhD scholarship at Edinburgh. Um, it was largely because my freelance journalism, because of the international financial crisis, was getting much more difficult to make work. And if I'd known how unlikely it was that I would get the PhD scholarship, I wouldn't have applied for it, <laughs> um, but I did. So that's kind of 10, 11 years ago now. And I never expected to become an academic. It wasn't a plan of any kind. I've never really planned anything very much in my life. But that's where I am now. One of the fascinating aspects of this podcast is that uh, when I ask this question to all the guests, you get the feeling that no one was born to be a scholar and an academic, uh, but our careers and our paths all will follow very strange directions. And uh, we, we might say that we end up working on something that we are passionate about. And, uh, and I think this is important also to, to remember because sometimes out there in the real world, people think that, you know, you, you just go straight from your degree into your PhD and you become a scholar. But often it's actually life experience that is much more interesting and helpful in, you know, sort of driving you towards something. And again, as you said, then there is the teaching part where you translate your knowledge into like information that you share with others. You know, they may agree, they may disagree, but that, that is an important aspect. And I think this is very, very, very important. But even when we talk about, uh, yeah, when, when we talk about Palestine, Jerusalem, there are so uh, complex and uh, there's so many layers. And, and, and I think, you know, the, the whole point is really trying to uh, unpack all of these layers and show that there's no black and white, but there's so many sort of like uh, Lego bricks, right? That you start building up yep. on top of each other. Yeah. Now, you started this work and uh, as I had the pleasure of reading your PhD thesis and examining that, and I must say that, uh, uh, not because I have to play compliments to you, but it was one of the easiest job I, I had in academia. <laughs> uh, 
and it was very much centered on the question of translation. So you worked on a number of, uh, I would say, liminal individuals, those that were literally in between uh, uh, periods, but also uh, organizations. And mm -hmm. um, you worked on this idea of translation. So the importance of using language of the other. And I was wondering if you can just briefly give us a sense of your work and how do you think this is important in, in the context of Palestine in Jerusalem where languages are obviously different and, and they still create barriers. And sometimes there is a political use of uh, languages. Yeah, so the, the kind of trajectory of my PhD research um, very much I think came from the fact that this one of the sort of questions that's always at the back of my head with whatever research I'm doing is really the issue of how quite ordinary people, um, I tend not to be terribly interested in studying kind of really elite figures, um, but how ordinary people negotiate day-to-day -day life, particularly in situations of colonialism or imperialism. So I think one of the, th and one of the things I think that sort of really prodded me in the direction of some of the figures that I was looking at so in, in, in that thesis, and that was Taufik Kanan, um, Elias Nasrallah Haddad, and Stefan Hanna Stefan, um, was the fact that it felt to me as if a lot of what was written on Palestine almost sort of, almost kind of seemed to suggest that people before 1948 somehow knew that 48 was going to happen and that the Nakba was going to happen. And even if it's not sort of directly teleological, there's always that kind of knowledge in, in, in your head. And obviously, once you're writing about it, after 1948, it's very hard not to be thinking in that way. But what I realized quite early on when I was looking at the writings of these, of these three men was that so much of what they were writing about and doing um, couldn't have happened if they had known that 1948 was going to was would was going to come about, um, and that whilst they are critical of colonialism, and they are all obviously to some extent proud of their heritage. Um, they are to, in some way Palestinian nationalists, um, even if they're not, um, at least in the case of the second two, Taufi Kanan was very much an activist in later years, but the other two, you know, not so much in, a, in, in, in the way that we would kind of understand that sort of term usually, but that they all had strong feelings about their place on the land and, and the desire for Palestinian culture to be recognized for its richness and to be respected. Um, but they were also working with Jewish colleagues, Jewish organizations, Jewish publishers. They were working in multiple different languages, as you say. And part of that, that was that they, all of them very much sort of wove between languages and wove between sort of different um, kind of communities and, and, and schools of thought because of that. So all three of them were educated at a German school, the Schneller School, also known as the Syrian Orphanage. Um, so it's a German Lutheran uh, establishment. Um, so they're all fluent in German. Obviously, they're all fluent also in Arabic. Um, they're all fluent in English. Stefan also has Ottoman Turkish, he's Syriac, so Aramaic, uh, Armenian, he was married to an Ar Armenian woman, um, French, um, and possibly some other languages as well. He's one of those sort of slightly terrifying people who, um, who, can, who can work in, 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 you know, sort of nine or 10 different languages. And, and um, there's a, there, there is actually a, 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 a little bit in the diaries or the day books of Hilma Granqvist, the Finnish um, uh, anthropologist saying that she was, she was thinking of asking him to teach her Arabic, but she was too scared because he had a reputation for being such a linguist. Um, 
and that she found this a little intimidating. Um, but I think they do various different things with language and with translation at different points. Um, and I think this is one of the interesting things about it. And, and, and while some of them are doing things that are definitely translation in the way that we would sort of immediately think of it, taking a text from one language to another, they also, um, especially Elias and Stefan, are, spend a lot of time doing things like writing phrase books and language manuals um, and teaching language, either privately or in classes. So it's not just translation in, in the sort of um, the, the, the kind of most formal sense. It's, it's a whole range of things they do as actors, as you say, quite liminal ones in some ways, who, who spend so much time explaining different cultural viewpoints and positions to different sets of people. So you've got Stefan writing um, phrase books of, of how to learn Arabic or how to teach yourself Arabic for native speakers of English and German. And these are published by Steimatskis, which is the, you know, the sort of the big stationary company still in, in, in Israel, but at the time had branches in Baghdad and, and Beirut and, and Damascus and all, all across the Middle East. Um, but he's also, for instance, translating the Ottoman Turkish travelogue, um, the Siahatname of uh, Evliya Celebi, who is a 17th century Ottoman traveler uh, who and, and, and Stefan chooses to translate for the quarterly of the Department of Antiquities of Palestine, which is where his day job is, the Palestine sections of Evliya's Seahat Name. So he is translating into English this very rich description of the, tra the Palestine that, that, that Evliya traveled through. Um, which is a, is a place that is depicted as being very um, uh, culturally rich, quite economically um, affluent, um, you know, where there's lots of bathhouses and markets and hands and, you know, it being a really, really kind of bustling kind of country, um, very much against, of course, the kind of stereotypes that politically some people were trying to use in Stefan's lifetime. Um, to justify Zionist political positions and colonial posi political positions. Um, so, you know, there's this sense that translation could be something that is about promoting or, 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 or demonstrating the richness of one's own culture, but also the fact that it, you know, has these political impacts in terms of being able to demonstrate certain things that do speak directly to political concerns of the time. Um, and Elias Haddad, I think, is doing something similar at times. So he is a he, he his career is as a teacher. He stays at the Syrian orphanage for almost his entire career, even after 1948, when after the Nakba it moves uh, to southern Lebanon. Um, and but one of the most interesting, I think, bits of translation that he does is to take Nut and Devisa, <clears throat> which is this late 18th century in German Enlightenment play, which is um, generally seen in kind of German studies as being about a call for tolerance, particularly towards Jewish people. Um, at an era, of course, when of course Jews were still being treated very, very badly in Western Europe um, and hadn't been given, you know, full citizens rights in most of Europe. Um, um, and, and, uh, uh, Elias translates this, um, and although he's fluent in German, I actually think from a couple of little errors of meaning that he actually probably translates it from an English version, um, because one of the misunderstandings is, is um, one around the word Hamlet, um, where it's actually referring to the Shakespeare play, but he takes it as being a reference to a small village, which is the English term for Hamlet, but, and that's that's got to have come from a particular um, uh, English version of, of English translation of the play. But he, so he translates this play and he, um, he writes a long introduction and a lot of introductory material to it. And he makes a very, very strong 
um, you know, strongly outlined call in this um, introduction that he writes that this shouldn't be just read in the Palestinian context and in the Arabic context, which is what he's translating into, that this shouldn't just be about um, kind of tolerance towards the Jews, as, as Gotthold de Frame Lessing, the original author, had intended, that it should be a call generally for rationality and sec um, uh, uh, although he's religiously faithful, he's calling for a secular system and for tolerance between all faiths and that if and he's basically saying if we have this this very rational and this quite secularist approach towards politics um, and towards how we relate to our fellow human beings then there won't be religious conflict and everything will be but much better in our in Lana and he he releases this in the early 1930s so if we think about the 1929 massacres, the, the, the Barak riots and things, he's, I think he's very much speaking to quite a specific set of, of debates that are going on within Arabic speaking Palestinian life, not kind of other parts of it, not, not to foreigners and things like this. So he's doing something quite different from what Stefan is doing. Stefan is presenting Palestine and Palestinian culture to English speakers in order to be able to say, look, this isn't what you're stereotyping us as. We are this and it's really great. Whereas Elias is using translation in a very different way. I think I think he is doing it in order to intervene in political debates within his own communities um, because he's putting it into Arabic. Since you talked about 1929, you made me think about something uh, about the power of languages. Do you think the lack of communication and also maybe something that was lost in translation was a missed opportunity for the two sides to uh, perhaps find some sort of a common ground? Or do you think that eventually languages were already nationalized and made this um, some sort of a part of an identity that eventually would, would clash with each other? I think from the, the kind of work that people like Lital Levy have done on um, the Maluls and, and the Moyals and things, I think we can certainly say that there is potential in languages. It, that I think that's probably um, quite an idealistic position to take with relation to Palestine at this point in time, because I think there are so many political forces pushing in other directions. But I think the fact that the linguistic situation there is so complex um, and you've got all of the things that people like Leora Halperin have written about in terms of the different, the, the, the huge politicization of languages and especially kind of the, the, the issues of sort of um, Hebrew and Yiddish and, 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 and other languages within the Jewish community. But the fact that it's not just that there is uh, politicization of kind of Arabic, Hebrew, English as the three official languages, but that there are so many other political strands going on between the different Jewish community languages, between the different European languages that are present, particularly in Jerusalem, and the relations that, you know, sort of English, French, German, Italian, and things have at different points in time and between each other. And, and, and the fact that those languages are also often bound up with um with sort of church politics and other religious politics so 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 you know the the kind of clashes that you that you might be getting um in terms of things like greek versus arabic or or, or different between different european languages too so i think probably we maybe get a sense from some of these um activities that there is a particularly heightened politicization of language in mandate Palestine because there is so much going on um, and of course you've got the the sort of um, the earlier the, the sort of earlier stages of the Arab nationalist kind of debates around um, not just Arabic but which Arabics people should be using too because um, so this is another thing that particularly um, Elias Haddad but also to some extent Stefan Stefan are involved in as well is is the is the kind of establishment of the idea that Palestinian Arabic is something worth learning. Um, it shouldn't all it shouldn't all just be futsa. 
that people, whether it's Palestinians themselves or whether it's um, foreigners who are learning Arabic should also be learning Amir as well as Fusa and that that's an important thing to be doing and that there are, you know, there are important works that people should be searching out sort of, 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 of kind of vernacular poetry and this kind of thing. So, um, and, he, and, and, you know, and Elias is doing this even before World War One. His, his first um, his first language manual is written with a German American scholar called Hans Henry uh, Schur, and he this is this is a this is a, a, a an Amir manual, um, and there is a sort of call to to respect uh, colloquial Arabic in this, and and a, and, a, and a sort of strong definition that he very much sees teaching Arabic to foreigners as an important way of conveying um, not just language, but also culture and politics and history and all of this kind of thing. Um, you know, they're, 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 or, or, or he, and, he and Stefan are both very keen on doing things like putting uh, folk tales and things like this into their language manuals to encourage people to engage, not just with sort of, you know, high Arabic uh, literature, if they're going on to future study, but also to engage with, with you know, popular level stories and things like this as well. And I was just thinking that, uh, I mean, in terms of languages, uh, you know, back during the mandate period, as well as today, I mean, in Jerusalem alone, and certainly throughout Palestine, there are dozens of languages spoken. And all of them can be at the same time a barrier, but also a possibility to, to develop uh, some yeah. form of uh, connection with each other, even though obviously in recent times, particularly within so-called national law in Israel, that's uh, removed Arabic as an official language. Yeah. Obviously, the, the, in that sense, all of the other languages are less important than Hebrew. And again, you can see the politicization of languages. And at yeah. the same time, you made me think about, you, you mentioned one of, the, uh, you know, one of the individuals that you worked on uh, used German. And I recently read a book um, by an author, uh, Thomas Parr, is a German author. The book is about German Jerusalem. And, you know, it's a short book. And essentially it, it talks about like this area of Jerusalem, the old uh, German colony and some of the areas surrounded by that, that during the mandate period that saw all of these uh, Jewish German refugees from Nazi Germany, they recreated it. Oh an area where German was the language and essentially yeah. they isolated themselves from others, mostly intellectuals, scientists, artists who didn't really find a necessity to engage with the others. And at the same time, they created this bubble of, of, of a German Jerusalem. And I, and I found it fascinating, again, you know, this, this idea of the languages, how they're used. Well, we talked about the mandate and, uh, you know, moving to your other sort of a big area of work. July 11, 1927, uh, Palestine uh, suffered the consequences of a major earthquake, uh, and the epicenter of the earthquake was Jericho. And for those who don't know, uh, obviously the earthquake was very big, uh, also in terms of magnitude, and uh, like in Jerusalem alone, there were more than 130 people that died as a consequence of the, of the earthquake, and a number of buildings was, were damaged. And of course, Jericho suffered the most uh, out of these earthquakes. So first of all, how did you get to work on this uh, event? And then if you can give us a sense of what happens on July 11th and obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the following days, you know, how did the rescue uh, work? So um, to, to, to kind of try and take those in the order that you asked them, um, I came to the earthquake as a project, um, partly because, as I said, Although I, I'm by absolutely no means trying to sort of belittle or, or downplay the political aspect of um, what goes on during the mandate in Palestine. It's not the, it's not the sort of formal political processes or the sort of that, that necessarily engage me most. And I, I spent a year um, as a postdoctoral researcher at Linnaeus University in southern Sweden. And one of my colleagues there is, had works, works on um, disaster history. She'd done her PhD on um, a major earthquake that took place in colonial India and the, the sort of political repercussions, particularly of that. 
in terms of the way sort of that the various resistance movements and independence movements reacted to it versus the way that the British administration um, uh, uh, dealt with it and things like this. <clears throat> um, and it kind of made me think, you know, Palestine also has this, you know, it's not, it's not an immense earthquake in terms of its strength. Um, the total death toll uh, is just under 300. So it's bad, but it's not enormous. Um, if we go back to 1837, and there, there's one that takes place slightly further north um, that kills far, far more people, is probably looking at kind of 5,000 odd. Um, but it's, you know, it's an important event. Um, and, but I think because there tends to be the focus on political dynamics and, or, or colonial dynamics, um, it seemed that very little had been done on it. Um, and also I was particularly interested as well in uh, kind of thinking more about environmental history. Um, I very much have a background in environmental activism and environmental journalism. Um, and I'd not really seen much up to then that made me think of how I could combine the two in terms of more historical research on Palestine. Obviously there's people who've done really interesting stuff on the occupation now, particularly the West Bank and its environmental um, impact. So um, Sophia Stamatopoulos Robbins and people like this who've looked at, you know, looking at things like waste um, and the environmental impact of the settlements and things like that. But it didn't seem that there was an awful lot using that kind of environmental lens for the mandate period. I mean, I suppose you've got Rosa Alaini looking at sort of land and land regimes and things like this. But um, so it was partly um, uh, that I was kind of interested to see what happened if with that kind of approach too. So um, I've kind of had this really interesting opportunity to sort of try and piece together, as you say, what actually happens on July 11th, because one of the things I realised is that um, a lot of the, firstly, a lot of the news coverage is inaccurate, um, particularly the international news coverage for obvious reasons, um, and also quite a lot of the memoirs that people have written that mention it are also inaccurate. Again, tends to be the international ones that are more that are more inaccurate. It's obvious that it's the sort of thing where people, if people have written a memoir some years later or decades later, they've sort of picked up little anecdotes, some of which are from that earthquake, but have gotten twisted. And indeed some where they've obviously conflated the 1837 Safad one with the 1927 um, Jericho one and things like this so there's lots of things that you kind of find scattered throughout the, the sort of primary sources um, that actually make it quite difficult to pin to get pin down what what goes on but basically what happens is that sort of in the early afternoon um, there are two main tremors um, the the end the epicenter is in the northwestern end of the Dead Sea. So it's kind of down towards En Gedi. Um, and um, because, so the, the, the Dead Sea is part of the very top section of the big network of geological faults, which we often call the African Rift Valley. Um, so it red, runs up through the Red Sea along the Wadi Araba, Dead Sea, um, the Jordan Valley, and then it kind of peters out as you get into Lebanon, southern Syria, northern Jordan. Um, but the and, and because it's a valley and it's kind of split down the middle um, and you've got lots of different geological layers, so different types of rock um, and um, different types of, of sort of land surface and things, the impacts are very, very different in different places. So Jericho actually gets away quite, um, quite safely compared with most other places. That's partly because of the geology and it's partly because the way that people in Jericho tend to build houses. So a lot of them were built of wood, they were quite light. Um, so even if they fell on you, you had a better chance of surviving. The worst death toll is in Nablus which suffers very, very seriously. 
Um, and that is probably down to a combination of the sort of Ottoman style building that has a lot of heavy stonework and the fact that the old city in Nablus is kind of getting quite run down at this point in time. So buildings that should have withstood earthquakes didn't, and particularly in the Samaritan Quarter. Um, and it's a similar thing to some extent, I think, in Jerusalem that um, old city homes, um, particularly those that are being used as kind of multiple family rented accommodation, so aren't necessarily being looked after particularly well by landlords and things like this, these are the ones where people are killed um, because these are the ones that are most likely to collapse. Um, there's also quite a high death toll in uh, Salt um, in Jordan. Uh, and, and, and serious damage there. Um, and there is a lot of damage, quite bizarrely, there's one particular village in the Galilee, Arena, um, which is near Nazareth, that is almost destroyed in terms of its built environment. Whereas villages only a few kilometers away are absolutely fine. And again, it shows the big difference of, of the geological situation in terms of um, how different places experience this. Um, and there's also a lot of damage in uh, Lud and Ramla. There's kind of various different responses that, that happen in all of this. Um, there's a lot of local communities who sort of swing into action and do things like um, put up tents uh, and help to feed people and things like this. So there's a lot of people from the old city in, in, uh, in Nablus who live under canvas, who are in tents for quite, quite some months afterwards. Um, ditto for uh, Jerusalem. Um, so, for instance, the Armenian Patriarchate, um, which has already, of course, got quite a lot of refugees from the genocide living sort of in, in the monastery and, and, and in, in its properties. Um, uh, helps to to sort of set up a tent city and they're uh, and they're living in that for a few weeks outside and of course the fact that it's July in some ways is probably quite helpful in that it is actually possible to do that you know it may well be that the death toll might have ended up being higher if this was in say January and people were having to to live outside um, in winter conditions um, the British state uh, the administration at this point in time isn't particularly well organized in terms of how it responds. The army does distribute uh, tents and sort of other camping equipment and things like this, because obviously they've got that for their own uses. Um, so they are involved particularly in Nablus, um, but it's quite variable. Um, and very quickly after the earthquake happens, um, George Symes, who is the chief secretary to the British administration, starts up a charitable appeal. So there's very much a kind of admission quite early on from the British that they are not going to pay for most of the sort of help that people need in this case. They, they, they're going to sort of do a bit of helping from particularly, as I said, from the army and from the local municipalities um, in terms of things like camping out and stuff. But, you know, they're very much saying from pretty early on, um, other people are going to have to put money into this. And we're, we're not going to bankroll it. And particularly, um, they, they use some of the money that's collected um, as to, to provide grants for the very poorest to repair or to rebuild homes. Um, but most people, all they will do is give loans and the loans I mean, it depends on the particular moment that you're looking at them with the with the sort of, you know, global financial situation as it is at the moment. I look at those loans and go, that's quite a high interest rate that they are charging on these. It's not, you know, this is not charity. They are, you know, they are quite um, ungenerous in how they in how they actually respond in terms of this. Um, but they also take the opportunity to do a certain amount of um what they would i guess have seen as modernization in terms of what they will give loans for um so they won't give um building grants for people who want to rebuild 
for instance, in certain parts of some of the old cities, especially Nablus. And, I, and it seems this is something that I'm still trying to sort of work out from the, the primary materials, but it does seem that this is perhaps one of the kind of key things that is the end of there being a Samaritan community in the old city in Nablus, because it's a poor community. It's quite a small community, so there's a limit to how much internal support they, they can give one another. And their, the, their quarter is quite badly damaged. Um, and this is the point where it seems that pretty much all the Samaritan community moves first outside the old city and then eventually up onto Mount Jazim. Um, so, you know, there are some quite um, clear kind of social impacts that we see in certain places. Um, there are also kind of other kind of things that we see that, it, that th and this is sort of one of the rationales that, um, that scholars who look at natural disasters, kind of one of the reasons that this is done is because it's this idea that a natural disaster like an earthquake or major flooding or a volcano is something that is beyond the control, at least in its initial stages, of any political or state body, um, and it infl and it affects everybody, but it affects everybody in different ways according to things like their access to funding, their ability to move, um, you know, their 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 networks, the people they know, who they can go stay with, all of those sorts of things. Um, so it's a sort of opportunity to cut across lots of the sort of social and economic and political patterns that we might trace in a more longitudinal study and just look at this one moment and see how it cuts across these things. And I think that's that sort of one of the things that an opportunity like this, uh, 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 an event like this kind of offers us in terms of who responds and how and, and who gets what in terms of the different support they get. So um, in terms of, of what gates rebuild, really the only things that the British pay outright to rebuild are British state buildings. They build a new government house because until up to this, this point in time, the High Commissioner has been living in the Augusta Victoria, so rented from the Germans. Um, and this is taken as the opportunity to build a new government house and they rebuild things like the railways and railway stations, but they will not rebuild public sort of community buildings. So what so buildings that are for public use, but not state run. And this is one of the things that kind of turns into a field of conflict um, uh, with regards to funding. So, for instance, the Sephardic community in Jerusalem um, suffers quite seri serious damage to its yeshiva and its uh, synagogue um, and to some other community buildings in the old city. And they had been in contact with, their, uh, with the uh, Sephardic community in London to ask for help. The Sephardic community in London had donated quite a lot of money, but they had done it through the general public um, state coordinated uh, charity appeal, rather than through these sort of more direct channels. Um, and what that meant is that the only Sephardic people who got help were poor ones who wanted to rebuild their own personal homes. The community, as a sort of inst at an institutional level, received nothing. And they were really angry about this. And there is this kind of quite sort of tetchy exchange of letters between Edmund Samuel, Herbert Samuel's son, so uh, who, who, who remained um, in Palestine after his father had been High Commissioner um, as a civil servant, and the Board of Deputies of British Jews and the Sephardic synagogue in, uh, in London. Uh, and, and kind of various other figures, um, uh, including actually the, the, um, uh, the representative of the Joint Distribution Committee as well in Jerusalem. So there's this kind of interchange of letters because the, the, the London Sephardic community have had these complaints from their Jerusalem co-religionists saying, why aren't you helping us? 
you know, you should be giving us some help, you know, really, guys, seriously, what's going on? Um, and, and the London ones are going, we have, we sent money, what's going on? Are, are, are the British not giving any of this money to Jewish people? What's, you know, what's happening? And there's this kind of five or six way web of, of misunderstandings and annoyance and, and, and all of this that's going on that I think is quite um, a, a sort of fascinating moment of different relationships and different expectations that are going on between different sets of people. Because of course, for, for centuries before, the Sephardic community in Jerusalem had had these relationships, these reciprocal relationships with, it, with international Sephardic um, communities of being sent um, funds to support them in order to maintain a presence in the Holy Land and to pray and, and to be scholars and this kind of thing. And you know, so they're used to this kind of direct personal relationship of support. And it's highly unusual for them to feel that they are being completely neglected. Um, and, and it's because there is this shift that we very much see at this sort of point in time. And it's the sort of thing that, um, that Keith Wattenpower has written about in terms of the different ways in which charity is conceived of, particularly on an international level in this sort of interwar period. Um, and we can really kind of, you know, watch that dynamic happening uh, between um, different sets of people in Jerusalem and other parts of Palestine and, in, and indeed Jordan um, as a result of the earthquake. You answered a lot of questions I had about uh, the repercussions of the earthquake. And um, I, I guess the only thing I wanted to ask you is very much about buildings. The obviously you talked about the, uh, the Jewish quarter in the old city and other areas of the old city itself. But uh, famously, both the Holy Sepulchre and the, uh, the Dome of the Rock were, were badly hit by the earthquake. And I was wondering to what extent uh, the British intervened to uh, sort of fix these buildings or if um, sort of uh, the management of the uh, sort of the destructions and so uh, the rebuilding operations were left with the, uh, the, the local communities. And, and if similarly with the Jewish community, there was some sort of international cooperation playing a role into rebuilding what was destroyed as a consequences of the earthquake yeah so rebuilding the sort of uh very kind of famous significant buildings is something that turns into a long-term headache and mess for everybody concerned as of course you know very well roberto the british kind of maintained this sort of slightly bizarre um, fiction of maintaining the status quo, this idea that there had been a, a status quo under the Ottomans and that they were going to carry on with this and that this meant that they weren't going to interfere except when it came to sort of the Greek, or the Greek community, uh, Orthodox um, churches finances, but that they weren't going to sort of interfere in religious um, affairs um, uh, in, in, in most respects. So with things like, as you say, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, the Kuba de Sakra, and the Al-Aqsa as well is quite badly damaged. It, it's something where they're sort of forced to react. Um, actually, a lot of the reactions don't happen for a while because although there is damage, quite a lot of it, both to the Al-Aqsa and the Sepulchre, isn't, doesn't become hugely obvious until there is a much smaller earthquake 10 years later, which exacerbates the damage that has happened before. So there sort of ends up being this very complicated dance, really, that goes on between in the case of the Holy Sepulchre, the British and the various different uh, Christian denominations over who is going to pay for what and what is going to be done. And there are all sorts of different plans that happen that include some people within the Catholic Church wanting to just knock the whole thing down and build an enormous new compound versus people who want to sort of preserve every last bit of what is there in place. And of course, these bring in the Department of Antiquities, 
as well as as the sort of more political and indeed you know the foreign office and and, and the British government back in the UK in terms of its relationships with things like um, the Vatican um, and European governments who perceive themselves as having sort of stakes in particularly the Holy Sepulchre. Um, so I mean these be these become issues of of British diplomatic policy to some extent. They are extremely complex. Um, and then in terms of the Al-Aqsa um, and the Dome of the Rock, there is again this, this um, element of the British um, having to negotiate, in this case, with the Waqf um, on the Hama Sharif um, and also with the Supreme Muslim Council um, as the, the, the people who have direct responsibility there. The British spend a lot of time saying that they can't pay for any of the renovations that are going on because that would be intervening in religious affairs. Um, given their attitudes to money the rest of the time, I think we could also be forgiven for thinking this is just them trying to get out of paying for anything if they possibly can. Um, so very little um, colonial money goes into this, although there is some elements of, of sort of um, aid in kind um, where, for instance, in the 40s, um, the Department of Antiquities brings a guy, but he's the, he's, um, he's the director of antiquities for Cyprus, um, AHS Megal, and he uh, is an architectural expert rather than a straight up archaeologist, and they bring him to survey particularly the Al-Aqsa. So there is, there is some British involvement in some of this in terms of, for instance, sourcing experts, but they don't kind of in, in, in their own legal um, terms, they don't have the right to enforce uh, rep repairs and change and things to any great extent on these kind of buildings um, because they're from they're, they're owned by WAFs and religious communities um, and, and because of the way that the, the British colonial uh, administration relates to those those legal forms. What is fascinating is to see just like a, a natural event may trigger so many reactions from local to international and you know this is just the nature of it I guess. And Absolutely and you see it in the international press coverage of the earthquake because as I said it's not that big an earthquake you know, the death toll, yeah, obviously it's terrible for the families and communities and things, but it's not huge, comparatively speaking. We're, we're talking about a sort of period of a year or two when we also have enormous earthquakes with huge death tolls happening in other parts of the world, especially China and Japan. Um, but the amount of actual press coverage that they get is, is it, it's completely out of proportion because of where it is. The, and, the interesting and, part of it is that if you just uh, Google 1927 uh, earthquake and you get and you land on the Wikipedia page, it takes you to one of the sources to the Milwaukee Journal, uh, just to give yeah. you a sense of uh, how widespread was the news of, of this event. I mean, even uh, smaller cities in the US, I mean, and again, Milwaukee was certainly bigger than many others, but uh, the news was reported everywhere. I mean, obviously, this got a lot Absolutely. of attention. Absolutely. And, you know, and you can trace in these news articles the way in which the same newswire story gets repeated and replicated. So, you know, you will have the, you know, the, the newswires who, who just send something out and it gets copied in every tiny local newspaper across Australia, across Europe, across America. Um, and and. And but the, but the people who write those original wires will want to have sort of added a bit of colour so that it's their news service that gets picked up. And one of the ones, for instance, that you see is that, as I said, the death toll in, and the damage and things in Jericho is, is comparatively small, given that it's the nearest city to the epicentre. Um, but two of the people that are killed are these two Indian ladies who are at the Winter Palace Hotel. And, it, and these two ladies, um, one of them is the wife of a, uh, a, a, I think he's retired by this time, High Court judge, Indian High Court judge, 
um, from Allahabad. And this guy is, you know, he's, he's quite important. He's been, he's been a high court judge. He's been involved in the uh, Islamic side of the Indian independence movement. So he's, you know, he, uh, he may be a sort of slightly more minor figure in it, but you know, he's been knocking around with, with, with Jinnah and people like this. Um, but he and his wife and some of their friends had been on Hajj and then they'd come to Palestine and they happened to be staying in the, um, in the Winter Palace. And as far as you can see from a combination of the news reports and um, the autobiography of a particularly horrible racist British policeman um, who, was, who was there not, after, not long after it happened, um, the gentleman had gone outside for a cigarette after lunch and the ladies had stayed inside. And as a result, they were killed when the, when the foyer came down. Um, but because the idea of these sort of two upper class Indian ladies being in Jericho is obviously a sort of, a, a sort of slightly surprising thing to whichever newswire reporter it is that picks it up, it ends up being reported all over the world. This sort of funny little factoid that probably has almost no impl implication for anybody actually living in Palestine at the time because they're just there as tourists but it's just this tiny little snapshot that you get of this this one moment of the of the earthquake and why these people are there and when so I mean I've been looking in into this because it, it sort of sent me off on a, a bit of a rabbit hole about the Indian presence in Palestine historically speaking um and you know and and, and that becomes very interesting but um but yeah, just the fact that these two poor ladies stayed in the foyer to have a cup of tea after after their lunch. And it is a sad history. story. And on the mm. other hand, it shows like how your research into this event will certainly bring about a lot of uh, stories of individuals who experience this tragic moment. And, uh, and often mm. the stories of individuals are literally buried with themselves uh, under the rubbles of an earthquake. And we don't know much about it as the focus is always on sort of the, the bigger part of it, you know, the damage, the, uh, the, the problems about reconstructions and the causes, the yeah. structural damage. But the reality is that there are people, lives under those rubbles. And it's, mm. I think it's important for us mm. as historians to bring those back. I mean, it's, uh, mm. it's, it's another and, and, layer. And, it, yeah, and, and just one tiny little incident like that can open up so much in terms of thinking about the fact that, that it was actually not uncommon for Indian Muslims going on Hajj to then come to Palestine, to go to Jerusalem, but then obviously in this case, you know, to add on something that as far as I can see, because to the best of my knowledge, there's no sort of significant Islamic shrines or anything particularly around Jericho, but they, they, you know, they've kind of added on a bit of what we would call, you know, modern style tourism onto their Hajj trip. And, uh, you know, and I think it, it it speaks to some kind of quite interesting moments as well in terms of you know the 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 way in which um, the the sort of routes of travel that are opened up by British colonial relations perhaps, but also them being part of this you know millennium old history of Indian Muslims coming to Palestine as part of their their sort of travels their their holy travels. We know a lot about our travelers, particularly European mm. and Western travelers, but the reality is that starting with uh, Indian troops that were posted by the British right after World War yeah. I, we do have an increased number of uh, Indians traveling. Again, it's part of an empire. Uh, communications are easier in a sense and faster and more reliable. Yeah. And, and I think you're right. This is a missing, uh, again, piece of this uh, you know, building that we don't know much about these Indians traveling throughout Palestine, what they left, what they brought yeah. back home, uh, their experience. So that's another fascinating um, mm. sort of aspect. And, the, and that it's not all religious travel as well, but certainly by this period, by the look of it, these, these couples are, you know, like I said, it looks very much like this is, you know, it's, it's July, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's high summer and they kind of in an act of madness have gone down to, the extreme heat that would have been Jericho at that point in time. But, you know, and, you know, you start to sort of follow some of the linkages and you realize that there's, there's also, for instance, anti-colonial activists visiting Palestine in the interwar period and just after, you know, yeah, all sorts of, of, of kind of fascinating connections and, and, and this sort of thing. As we reach the end of this fascinating conversation, I want to bring you to your 
sort of new project, which is called The House of a Priest. The House of a Priest is an edited work by yourself, Sharbel Nassif and Karen Sanchez. And essentially it's the discussion of an unpublished and untranslated memoir by a senior member of the Orthodox Church and also an Arab nationalist, Nikula Khouri. Uh, can you tell us who was this individual and why is you know deserves such a such a work? Again, you know we're going into this question of liminal figures, uh, neglected figures that sometimes uh, they've simply been forgotten, but they do play a major role in the development of ideas and the spreading of ideas in Palestine in Jerusalem. Mm. Yeah, so this book, um, and it'll be out with Brill in June, um, and the uh, the digital version will be open access. Um, so that's obviously really exciting. So um, this started off with um, Karen Sanchez Samara and Shabel Nassif, the two people that I worked um, on this with, coming across Khoury's autobiographical typed manuscript. Um, in an archive in Beirut some years ago. Um, and with the permission of the archive holders, um, they got it uh, roughly translated. Um, and then when I, I spent a, a, a brief period um, uh, as a postdoctoral fellow with their project at Leiden University, um, and I was kind of given this rough translation to, to work on and to kind of work out what would be feasible as um, some form of publication. So what the book is, is this autobiography uh, annotated and elaborated on and, and things, but because it has, because he is uh, a combination of uh, a member of the Greek Orthodox clergy and an Arab nationalist and involved in all sorts of other stuff, there's a lot of different aspects to it that maybe sort of somebody might be very familiar with some of the material in there and, and, and totally not with others. Um, and then we have also added on to that an introduction which kind of locates him within the various actors, the sort of histories of some of the things that he's involved in. Um, and the, including things like the history of the Greek Orthodox Church and the Arabization movement within that, um, and also of um, aspects of uh, Palestinian nationalism at this point. So why does he deserve his own book? Um, I think partly it's about the, the simple fact that autobiograph autobiographies, memoirs, diaries of Palestinians from this period are worth getting out there because there are so few historical voices um, uh, that we can go to. Um, and so there's, there's just that straight fact. And, there, and then there are kind of the various ways in which this guy's life is absolutely fascinating. So he's born in Birzeit in the 19th century. So uh, he's starting out under the Ottomans. His father is a village priest, um, but they are sent um, in the early uh, years of the 1900s to Karak uh, to build up the Greek Orthodox presence there and to, and to minister the, to, the, to the Greek Orthodox community in Karak. So he is there during the, the uprising that takes place um, that's kind of partly around local concerns and partly uh, counter-revolutionary against the, the Young Turk revolution in the Ottoman Empire. So they're there during that. Um, uh, Nicola himself, although he's very young, seems to have been part of the, the Young Turk movement in the, in the town. Um, so there's their narration, there's his and his family's experiences during that. Um, there are his experiences um, with it as, as a very combative um, member of the sort of um, push to Arabization in the, in the Greek Orthodox Church and the various fights he has with the, the hierarchy of the church. Um, there are aspects of his uh, more kind of um, uh, nationalist and secular activities. <clears throat> but, then, um, but then also there's the kind of overlap between the two. So for instance, um, when the uh, question of the possibility of partitioning Palestine is first negotiated at the League of Nations or debated at the League of Nations in 1937, 
there is a, a, a kind of Arab nationalist slash Palestine nationalist delegation there. Um, and he is a sort of junior part of that. But the particular role that he is asked to play is that instead of going directly to Geneva, he is asked to travel through the Balkans by train to visit the heads of state and heads of church of all of the Orthodox countries in the Balkans to try and drum up support for the Palestinian position. So there are account, his account of him visiting Belgrade um, and various places in Romania and all sorts of, 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 of other places and, and Greece and other places in between in order to try and get Orthodox support um, from all of these um, different um, countries at the League of Nations um, debate on the subject. Um, uh, so it's, it's, there's all sorts of fascinating accounts on various levels. And, and, you know, obviously there is also family stuff, stuff to do with what happens to his siblings during World War I, during the, um, during the Nakba, um, and all sorts of things. Um, so in many ways, it's a really fascinating memoir. It's also in some ways quite um, uh, an odd memoir to work with. Um, he is very, very into self-promotion to the point where there is quite a lot of having to filter out places where he is making claims to things that we know from the historical record that it's actually other people should probably have been given the credit for things. Um, he spends a lot of time hugely bigging himself up. Um, and he also, it's, it, it, it's, it's, a pro, it's quite a sort of challenging memoir to work with, um, particularly in relation to this Balkan aspect that I was talking about, because he is also very, very enthusiastically praising um, heads of state and people that he meets through the Orthodox connections in the Balkans, who later become um, uh, allies of Hitler. And, he's, and he wrote his memoirs in the early 1950s. So he, you know, that he could have had the benefit of hindsight on some of these, but he very much is taking a kind of, they, they, they supported Palestine and the Orthodox church and therefore I'm, I love them. <laughs> and I'm going to be entirely uncritical of everything they ever said. So. There is this sort of, you know, kind of trying to sort of pick your way through this, this really quite odd memoir. Um, and I mean, Chabel, the, the, the co-editor of it, who, of course, is the, the only one of us who is a native speaker of Arabic, was just like, wow, this guy loves himself so badly. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, 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 and how you sort of as a it's that sort of question of how as a historian, how you deal with your emotional reaction to the to the per person that you're working on. And my history has tended to be to, to, to find myself working on people who I, I really, really like. Um, Stefan Stefan particularly, I, I've, I've always found an absolutely fascinating character um, and, 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 and very sympathetic um, in everything that I can kind of find in his work. But Nicola, it's, he's, he's hard to like, but he's, he's absolutely fascinating on a historical level. This was Sarah Irving, a level whom a early career research fellow, a lecturer at Staffordshire University, and also the editor-in-chief of Contemporary Levant. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.